Hello, everyone, and welcome to Layer by Layer. Today, we're going to talk about our Shopify integration, uh, how we deal with our suppliers, and then a few things around large format furniture and maybe what the Apple Watch is up to. So this should be a fun one. Uh, first of all, starting with Shopify, uh, we will uh, have an official announcement about this soon, but we will have a Shopify integration coming out soon for our API. So anyone with an existing Shopify store will be able to go into the Shopify uh, app store and basically connect directly to our print farm so that when orders come in through your Shopify store, they'll immediately port to us. We will print to them and ship them out to your customers. So 3D printing and drop shipping will be coming very soon, um, which should be pretty darn fun. Um, also, uh, next week we will have another Kickstarter. Uh, the Splash Blaster didn't go, but that's fine. We tried it out. We knew it was kind of a push. Um, but it'll be new files uh, in, within the context of a currently uh, relevant event that's going on. So we think it'll be a, a pretty good one and also a really good example of how to use like that Shopify integration that we were talking about. Uh, anyhow, uh, last week we did a video about Push Plastic. And Push Plastic is one of our suppliers. Uh, we work with a lot of filament manufacturers to make all kinds of stuff um, to get specific sorts of materials that we need. Even though we make a bunch of material ourselves and are working to make more, we're growing so fast and there's really specific needs that we have uh, to where there's just, we got to have suppliers. Somebody who does carbon fiber, somebody who does really good colors, somebody does this, that, and the other thing. So all of our suppliers are important to us. And we think it's a good idea for us to promote them, especially to you guys, the audience here, because number one, we vetted them. So they're, uh, it's a decent opportunity for you to know where to look for good, reliable resources. Um, and hopefully it helps grow their business so that they can help us grow our business. It's a, we're a very kind of grow the pie kind of a company um, to where if we're trying to stop somebody from getting a hold of this to get a hold of that and that kind of thing, it's not really worth it. So good, good partners and partnerships, we want to make sure that we promote. So that's why we did that push plastic video. And we plan to have more here into the future because we want to highlight those. Um, but yeah, ultimately the suppliers kind of go along with like the client side of like we show what we make and we show where those parts come from and where that material comes from. Um, so that it's just as, as transparent as possible because there's, there, there's places where secrecy is useful. Um, but the context of how the sausage gets made should not be something behind closed doors most of the time. So we're going to try to be as transparent as we possibly can about that. Um, anyhow, uh, let's see here. Oh, videos coming up here. Uh, we're going to do a few videos about myths in 3D printing, and we've covered a few of these already that kind of come up within our, our design for mass production 3D printing series. Um, but the myths are like food safe and UV resistant. Uh, these things are wildly misunderstood. Uh, people think that it's a yes or no answer, which it's not, and the reasons for the yes or no answer are very imprecise. So we're going to try to really break down what constitutes, what makes it food safe, what makes it UV safe, when does this matter, when does that matter, so on and so forth, because it's not a, a catch-all of like, oh, you can't possibly put PLA in the sun. Yeah, yes, you can. Um, so um, we're going to try to do some videos really diving into that and explaining why it's relevant in this way and that way and so on and so forth. Um, so there should be some fun videos coming up here in the next well, few weeks. Um, those are our deeper kind of research videos, so we want to make sure everything's pulled together. Generally, we publish every day, so we're always in a big old hurry to get stuff out. Um, so we got to print off the part, get the pictures of it, film the video, get it out the door so that we stay within our schedule. Um, so <laughs> we, we got to plan fairly far ahead, and once in a while we might have to merge a couple videos into one. Uh, we had gone all the way up to seven days a week there for a minute, but that wasn't quite sustainable. So we've dropped back down to about five videos a week right now. Um, and we might be dropping a little bit lower so that we can do more of these really deep dive kind of a videos. Um, so that should be fun. Um, but news stuff or just general kind of industry stuff within the context of FDM, why is large format so much more popular? Oh, um, large format is in a really good spot to pop off right now. And it's kind of why the industry is latching on to it. Uh, there's a lot of large format FDM machines out there and coming out. Um, and the reason being is because a lot of them appear to be attempting to replace uh, plastic furniture. 
Um, the reason for this is that number one, a lot of industrial designers work inside of furniture so that you have access to models that are good and unique. Um, but large format is a really good way of making furniture that is good and unique, and you're able to create all kinds of new styles. It's kind of in the area of like shoes. Uh, 3D printed shoes have kind of been popping off in the last couple of years too, um, because designers have access to them. There's been some good services come up that support them, um, and some interest from the world in general. But uh, it's the large format is a good application. I think it will commoditize exceptionally quickly because a large format machine does not have much special about it as far as secret sauce, especially when printing a chair. Um, it'll, it'll be quite premium for a while, but it will commoditize really fast. As soon as it starts, it's going to scale down very quickly. Um, what I would love to see is a service or a, a company that's doing large format furniture start building out, making like custom furniture for like hotel chains and that kind of stuff or shared working spaces. There's another number of companies that manufacture custom furniture as it is right now, but using a 3D printed variant um, would be really cool so long as the plastic nature of it uh, doesn't suddenly make that furniture seem kind of like something from the 60s where everything was plastic, but it doesn't really, very bold and doesn't really hold up anymore these days. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a fashion item. Furniture is kind of a fashion item. Um, but 3D printing can really enable that because you can create a lot of unique and individualized pieces at lower volumes, um, but still be really scalable because large format for furniture is very, very scalable when compared to somebody stapling together a chair. Um, the alternative, it's, it's a good trade, and it's not more expensive to use printing at all uh, or to use, like, large molds, which is just terrible, um, if not outright impossible in many cases because a large format mold can basically make one of those nasty white lawn chairs, but it can't make, like, real furniture. Um, let's see here. What else we got? Why are all of our machines the same? Oh, yeah, this comes up from clients and, and down in the comments on a decent uh, basis. But basically, what type of machines do we have and how many are, or what different sizes do we have? Uh, we have one size. That, that's not true. We have two sizes, a regular and then one that's slightly taller. But it's the exact same machine except for lengthening out the vertical struts of the thing. Um, the... We use only one single machine that is backwards compatible through all of our machinery because if you don't, then it's impossible to manage a farm that's as large as we were. If we had a Creality and an Ender and a Thing and our custom one and that one that we modified and so on and so forth, it would be impossible for anyone to maintain or operate those machines because each one would be a little bit weird. And within the context of a print farm in general, there's already kind of that um, variance between performance of individual machines that you have to compensate for inside of the production process. Um, so we only use one machine in order to improve the reliability of the system as a whole. Um, but yeah, all that stuff. Uh, thank you so much for guys watching the video earlier this week about the, the tees. Uh, the golf tee was a really fun one to do because generally tiny little parts like this at really large volumes of like 100K or 10K are better to mold. I, I mean, just bluntly, uh, this is a cheap, easy thing to do. Uh, and when we went into the video, we weren't like sure um, how it was going to turn out like financially. We were just like, oh, this was how you would design it. Um, but it also turned out to be more affordable. I mean, we could mass produce these by the millions and uh, basically make them for a slightly higher cost than uh, typical molded tees right now. But you could say that this has a lot more features inside of it, is more reliable, won't break immediately. It's not disposable, which most tees are. Um, so it's a, a unique kind of a situation there because this is actually both through better designed for 3D printing, so it can be mass produced for nothing. Um, but then fundamentally, the whole layout of it all makes it more affordable than anything else would ever be. Um, so this was a really neat kind of design study that came out to show, oh, yeah, 3D printing is way better than everything else out there. Um, so it was a fun video to work on. Uh, as far as the files, uh, we will probably release these files soon. We're trying to figure out what we're going to do with all the files that we've got. Um, a number of the videos that we do will automatically lead into a Kickstarter so that you guys can get a hold of the files. We don't want, really want to leave them up live all the time um, because they're... Uh, 
it doesn't work. <laughs> and I think I talked about this a little bit last week. We don't want to just post the STLs and you buy it and you download the STL because now the STL is gone. We no longer have it. Uh, Kickstarter contains it a little bit more and people who are legitimately just interested in printing it. Um, so there's some of that. Um, but also these things are, we don't know what to charge for it, but we also don't want to give it away for free because <laughs> it did take time and effort and it's a very good product and a good product should be available. And we're not selling advertising, so we can't give you a good product like Gmail and still make a living off of it. We have to make a living off of the things that we do. Um, so we're, we're, we're figuring out the model of how to share the files in a way that works for us because um, we're not in a hurry. Uh, but we want to do it in a way that's fair and, and decent for you guys and get you good files. Um, the other thing is, too, with like video files that we make these, these aren't always fully optimized and they sometimes have some weirdness. So we don't really want to just turn them loose right after the video because you get kind of a half-baked thing. Uh, we're a very deep product-focused company, so we don't want to turn out anything that's um, incomplete. Um, but, yeah, thank you all for watching that video. It was a fun one to do, and it was a nifty thing. A really nifty thing, uh, especially in the context of yeah, the total scale of it, because you could produce millions of these with printing just fine. And the fact that you eliminate shipping and the amount of warehousing and all the rest of it is just a, such a big deal for something like this. Um, it's a really nifty deal. Um, oh, following into that, the Apple Watch. So this is a rumor. We, there's really no way to know if this is true, but... Uh, one of the Apple rumors guys uh, got hearsay from one of the, the factories that Apple was 3D printing the titanium um, knobs for the watch. What they call them, like the dial. They have a special term for it, a special Apple term. I don't remember what it is. Um, but like the dial and a couple and the buttons for the Apple Watch Pro, which is a full titanium Uber hiker, save ya in the wilderness kind of a watch. Um, but they're going to start 3D printing some of those parts. Allegedly, we've got traffic outside. Sorry, guys. Um, but they're going to start printing some of these parts. And it, it makes sense because, like, the dials on those things are this big. You can put, like, a million of them in the sing smallest build volume of any metal 3D printing machine. And they're so simple and round and basic that there's no worry about shrinkage or anything else. It's just it, it's an easy part to print with in metal. Um, stupidly easy, actually. Um, so there was, um, but it's an interesting example because Apple is a really large maker of stuff. Um, they're making billions of phones every year, <laughs> basically. So the, the fact that they're messing with this is indicative of the fact that they're starting to test with it. Because number one, it's the, their premium product, so they can afford more expensive components inside of it to experiment around with. Also, those more expensive components... Man, we've had so many noises today. <laughs> it's just been one of those days. But uh, the Apple, uh, there's so there's so many new features that you can put into like a 3D printed part that they can introduce those at the premium level and then say, okay, people really like these and then bring them down lower. So it's a typical kind of an intro um, of a new feature set, but it also lets Apple play around with printing to where they might want to do it with little watch cases be, or maybe some heat sinks or anything like that. Because Apple is so product focused that like to shrink some of these things down, they can't take the heat anywhere. But 3D printing can now create uh, heat sinks that are way more efficient than could ever be manufactured before and that kind of stuff because it's not just a, a grid that you're stapling on the side of something. There's just all of this stuff that you can do. Um, so it's... It's no doubt Apple is doing this. It makes sense in all kinds of different directions that they would start prepping. And they'll st it start with their high-quality production, uh, their uh, one-offer kind of thing. And then they would go down, introduce it at the next level, test some features, and then introduce it in more and more of their parts to where, yeah, someday they might be printing every uh aluminum body with metal printing so that they can get heat sinks and as much density as they possibly can. Though right now, that's like 10 years away before they'd be printing like the Apple phone bodies themselves, um, just with the state of where metal printing is. But Apple's messing with it. And the fact that they care 
uh, should make everybody else kind of care. Because yes, there's so much functionality, new functionality that you can get that was never possible before, because now you can make impossible geometries with printing that you could not ever do with any manufacturing process before. And you can do it super affordably because rather than stacking on layers where you put down a plate and then you put on another plate and put in a screw and then stack another thing and so on and so forth, you just print it all and the whole part comes out with all that stuff integrated so you eliminate downstream assembly, which is quite expensive. Um, you can improve reliability because somebody won't forget a screw. Uh, you simplify your factories because, again, you don't have all those steps and verifications. So 3D printing has so many benefits to where you can boil stuff down uh, that it makes a lot of sense to do. Um, but anyhow, there's all that. Uh, that's pretty much it for today, guys. This is going to be, I suppose, kind of a quicker show. I don't have any big grants to have this time around. <laughs> Um, I'm going to stay stay away from it for just a moment here before we turn anything else loose. But uh, let us know if there's there's topics that you want us to cover on the channel um, or different things that you want us to do. We're always open to new formats and we want to continue growing the channel as we go here and making sure that the information is useful and unique. Uh, we don't really want to cover past paths because the 3D printing world, everybody has printed the stuff and said that how to do PLA and all that kind of thing. We don't really want to be in that realm. We want to find kind of the unique things that are focused on mass producing stuff. Um, so if there's like examples that you've seen or companies making mass produced stuff, we always want to see those guys for our real 3D printed product series. Um, and if there's particular areas of design that are weird or, or nifty little tricks, uh, we'd love to see those and use them. I'd, I'd actually kind of like to do a video like just dedicated to like Clockspring. If you have not seen Clockspring, you should subscribe to his Patreon because he is without a doubt one of the, he might be the best 3D printed product designer in the world um, that I have seen. He's so good. Um, but anyhow, um, that's pretty much it. All right, guys, I'm going to turn you loose there. Have a great rest of your day. And... Have a good one.